So, uh, as we said, I'm Anthony Velia, um, and I'm a bit of a nerd. I got into vestibular rehab. That's kind of where I landed. Um, so let's get right to it and make sure I know how to do this. There we go. Um, so yeah, first off, we're going to be talking about how the body actually takes in external stimuli in order to output balance. Um, it's a lot more complex than just the automaticity we expect. Uh, a couple common vestibular disorders that you're going to see whether or not you specialize in this, um, whether or not you're an ENT or a PT. And finally, what are we going to do about that? So right off the bat, three sets of threes. We're able to take in visual stimuli with our eyes. We are very prone to being able to line up with the horizon very effectively. Um, also seeing obstacles, so if there's any issue there, balance is at stake. Somatosensation, if that's dealing with mainly touch and proprioception, if I start to notice that I have more pressure on my left foot, I must be leaning that way. But maybe someone has neuropathy, they don't have a lot of sensation in their foot. My left quadriceps, for instance, might register more activity, so I'm also going to be able to tell that I'm going that direction. Finally, equilibrium sense or equilibrioception, talk in the inner ear. We'll get back to that in a second. Uh, the nervous system, though, has three places that we actually integrate all of these. The cerebellum is dealing with a lot of the fine-tuning, um, and especially postural control. Um, in order for my spine to stay upright, those muscles have to be operating just precisely so that I'm not tipping over throughout. My cerebral cortex is dealing with motor planning. If I want to lean to the left, I need to be able to get all of the muscles on board effectively. And lastly, the brain stem is dealing with um, a lot of the reflexes that are involved with the inner ear, the eyes, and the muscles. We're going to come back to that in the next slide. Um, so the inner ear itself, um, right off the bat, if you don't have some little inner ear model and you are interested at all in vestibular rehab, uh, this is something that I highly recommend. Um, it's really great for visualizing how this operates. And just as a great anatomy overview, three semicircular canals that are dealing with the rotational movements of the head. They are not prone to any gravitational influence. They only deal when the head is actually in motion. The utricle and saccule, they deal with linear acceleration. You hit the brakes real hard, they're able to register that inertia. Um, utricle is dealing with anything transverse. Saccule is dealing with anything in a sagittal plane. Um, and those three systems in the inner ear are able to register so much in terms of balance. Um, and that's where a lot of things can go wrong. So the reflexes that we're talking about, um, if my inner ear registers any kind of motion and I'm looking at a random spot on the wall, my eyes are still able to take um, perfect aim at that target even when my head is moving. This is an extremely fast reaction. Um, it's very automated and gaze stabilization is a massive part of our balance. If there's any delay in this, we're gonna feel disequilibrium because every time our head moves, we have to retake in the environment because our eyes didn't keep track. The VCR and VSR, vestibulocolic and vestibulospinal reflexes, also take in the information from the inner ear, but they're dealing with it in a different way. They're two flavors of the same thing, really. But for if I register a sudden head movement, my neck is going to be able to orient with gravity, and so is my spine. Uh, the cervical ocular reflex is kind of the opposite end of things, and we're going to be talking about cervicogenic dizziness in a little bit. If my neck registers a movement, <clears throat> particularly in a side bend motion, my eyes are able to stay in line with the horizon so that I can see as effectively as possible, even though my head's moving. Lastly, the optokinetic response. Um, if something does move across my vision, my eyes are able to keep track with it. Again, if there's any delays in this, if we start to experience choppy, saccadic movements, I'm having to retake in the environment repeatedly. That's not effective for keeping us upright. So if any of these reflexes or if anything's going wrong with the system, we're going to experience disequilibrium, dizziness. And to talk more about diagnosing dizziness, we have the wonderful Dr. Natasha Howard next. It's this little body. Hello. As mentioned, my name is Natasha Howard. I am an audiologist at Valley ENT, and I specialize in the diagnosis of vestibular dysfunctions. So what does dizziness mean to you as primary care physicians? Well, according to the CDC, dizziness is the third most common complaint heard in physician offices. Back pain is one of the most common. And how does this relate to ear, nose, and throat? Well, 85% of vertigo and balance dysfunctions may be inner ear related. 
There are a variety of tests used to diagnose vestibular dysfunctions, the first being audiometry. Um, at minimum, it includes a tympanogram and a hearing test. A tympanogram is going to evaluate the middle ear, assessing for perforations in the tympanic membrane or fluid in the middle ear cavity. And a hearing test will look at the cochlea, the hearing organ. The cochlea and the balance organ are both housed within the inner ear. They function separately, but there are a few different vestibular disorders that can affect the two. So it's always nice to start out with a hearing test first. Video nystagography, as shown in the top picture, it's the gold standard um, for vestibular dysfunctions. It has three different subtests, the first being the ocular motors. Ocular motors are screenings for central pathologies. The third subtest is a positioning testing. That's primarily going to be looking for a condition called benign proximal positional vertigo. It also gives information on compensation for other inner ear pathologies. And lastly, we have the caloric irrigations of the VNG. That's one of the only tests that can give us information on how much the brain is receiving from the inner ears independently. So the brain should be receiving equal information from those uh, inner ears, but sometimes with different uh, pathologies, one's functioning too much, one's not functioning enough, uh, the brain gets unequal si uh, signals and can result in some dizziness. Auditory brainstem response, it's an evoked potential, as shown in the bottom picture there. The patient is hooked up with electrodes and they listen to an auditory stimuli. For an ABR, we're assessing or looking for an acoustic neuroma, a tumor on cranial nerve 8. Electrocochleography is another evoked potential. It's assessing for a disease called Meniere's disease. The VEMP, the vestibular evoked myogenic potential, is measuring the function of the saccule, utricle, and the superior vestibular nerve, which supplies those two organs and is also a branch of cranial nerve 8. The next two tests, the video head impulse and the rotary chair, as shown in the top two pictures, complement the caloric irrigations of the VNG testing, but at different frequencies. Calorics are limited to a very low frequency of 0 0.003 hertz. V-HIT tests super high frequencies, and the rotary chair tests all the frequencies in between, ranging from 0 0.01 to 0 0.64 hertz. These fre frequencies represent more real-life movements. Furthermore, the V-HIT evaluates all six semicircular canals, whereas the V-NG and rotary chair are exclusive to the horizontal canal. Rotary chair is good for monitoring peripheral dysfunctions over time. It's also the gold standard test for di uh, diagnosing bilateral vestibular dysfunction. Next, the computerized dynamic posturography. It's in the picture on the bottom is where the patient is placed in a platform and tested in a variety of different conditions. They're tested with their eyes open, eyes closed, um, with the surround possibly moving or staying still, or the platform beneath them moving. It gives information on how well the eyes, the inner ears, and the muscles and the uh, ligaments in the lower legs work together to keep our balance. It's primarily used for uh, diagnostics diagnostic testing and treatment. Um, however, it can start to detect some aphysiologic performance. Furthermore, most of our tests are objective, making it nearly impossible to fudge any of the data anyways. Lastly, in certain cases, imaging studies are ordered to provide more structural versus functional information. The pros to ordering vestibular testing first is the cost. Um, so when we're looking at our images, for example, uh, imaging studies can start to show an acoustic neuroma. We also have a test called the ABR that can look at that as well, uh, and it costs about a tenth of the cost of the MRI. It takes less time, and it's reportedly more comfortable than the MRI. A con is that the ABR is not as sensitive uh, as the MRI. Next, I'm going to be talking to you uh, about some of the vestibular disorders. Uh, not all of them, and these not necessarily are common, but they are well-known ones. First, the acoustic neuroma. It is a benign, usually slow-growing tumor that grows on cranial nerve 8. It's also known as a vestibular schwannoma. It affects, affects about 1 in 100,000 uh, individuals, and it usually presents with a unilateral hearing loss, unilateral tinnitus, and dizziness. Benign proximal positional vertigo, or BPPV for short, is the most common disorder of the inner ear. It's when the otoconia um, are dislodged from the gelatinous membrane within the utricle and become free-floating in one, one or more of the six semicircular canals. 
The most common cause of BPPV is head trauma when we're 60 years or younger. Somebody gets hit in the head and it literally dislodges those crystals from where they belong. But as we age, that membrane that the otoconia uh, are housed in uh, becomes a little bit less sticky and the condition can become more prevalent with age. Bilateral vestibular hypofunction, that is when both of the inner ears are not functioning up to par. There's several different peripheral and central pathologies uh, as listed that can cause this. However, 70% of people with bilateral vestibular hypofunction will complain of oscillopsia, otherwise known as bouncy vision. Cervical genetic dizziness uh, is a dizziness that typically comes from the neck. Patients will complain of dizziness with different head positions or uh, neck positions. Enlarged vestibular aqueduct is a male formation of the inner ear that occurs during fetal development. It uh, always presents with the hearing loss um, and sometimes with dizziness. It's a be best to avoid head traumas with this condition as it can make it worse, so early detection is essential. Labyrinthitis and vestibular neuritis, uh, they are inflammations of the inner ear. More specifically, labyrinthitis is the inflammation of the labyrinth itself, so it causes hearing loss and dizziness, whereas vestibular neuritis is inflammation of the nerve, causing only dizziness. Mal de debarkment, it's caused by exposure to a movement, then removal of that movement. So sea travel is the most common cause. However, it can also come from traveling by airplane, train, car, etc. It can even come from sleeping on a waterbed. Meniere's disease is when the inner ear retains too much sodium, not allowing it to function properly. Uh, Meniere's disease typically presents itself with four cardinal sim symptoms, the first being oral fullness, where the ear feels full, plugged up. Tinnitus, often described as roaring, almost as, as if a freight train. Uh, fluctuating hearing loss, we typically see that in the lower frequencies as opposed to the traditional high-frequency hearing loss. Some days it's good, other days it can be bad and then long-standing dizziness, lasting hours at a time. Migraine-associated vertigo. Migraines in general are extremely common. They are more common than asthma and diabetes, and they're almost as more common as hypertension. 40% of migraine patients will have vestibular symptoms, and that doesn't mean that, they need, that, that a headache goes along with it. As we know, migraines can migrate, and if they're occurring near the vestibular system, they can present themselves with dizziness. Perilymph fistula, it's a defect that allows the perilymphatic fluid from the inner ear to enter the middle ear. This is especially true with different pressure changes, so coughing, sneezing, bending over, a heavy lifting, fast elevators, airplanes, or even mountain passing. The patient typically presents with oral fullness, fluctuating or sensitive hearing, and dizziness. Persistent postural perceptual dizziness, triple PD for short, is a non-vertiginous, unexplainable dizziness provoked by environmental or social stimuli. It usually follows a pre-existing vestibular disorder. So, for example, we may have a patient who has BPPV. We clear them of BPPV, but they still are feeling dizziness outside of the expected residual dizziness phase. Uh, they can get categorized in this, uh, this disorder and get additional help. It also can follow like medical illnesses or psychological stress. Superior canal dehiscence, um, it is an opening in the bone overlaying the superior semicircular canal. It's going to present with conductive hearing loss and dizziness that's provoked by loud sounds or pressure changes, uh, as, I as I mentioned with perilymph fistula. Uh, people with this condition also complain that their voice sounds abnormally loud to them. So here's an example of just a portion of the testing, the VNG only. The first few tests are the ocular motors, the middle portion is the positional testing, and then the last part is the caloric irrigations. In this case, the patient had right beating static, or right beating spontaneous nystagmus. Uh, it did suppress with fixation, so that makes us start to think it's more peripheral versus central. She also had that uh, static position, I don't know, nystagmus as well, throughout all positioning testing. And she had a caloric weakness of 
uh, to the left. Anything over 25% for Clorox is considered clinically significant. So when you put all three of those findings together, uh, she is suffering from an uncompensated left vestibular hypofunction. So her left ear is not giving enough uh, information to her brain. Although we were thinking more peripheral with this uh, patient because her uh, her, uh, spontaneous nystagmus was suppressing the fixation, her ABR was also abnormal. So we ordered uh, some imaging studies to rule out or confirm an acoustic neuroma. And next, I'm going to be turning it back over to Anthony. All right, you guys are stuck with me again. So uh, this slide right off the bat is very busy. Um, This is not something we're going to be going through in detail right now. Um, This is a cheat sheet for later. If you are having a patient um, experiencing dizziness and you're not sure where to begin, maybe you don't have an awesome audiologist like Natasha who can diagnose with you, Um, This is a great place to start, Um, especially that keywords column there. Um, Common complaint I hear, patients say, every time I get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, I don't want to turn the light on and wake up my husband or my wife. Uh, So they feel incredibly unbalanced. Uh, If they don't have visual input, their inner ear should be able to compensate fairly well, but it's not. So I'm suspecting a vestibular hypofunction. That's where I'm going to begin. Um, But again, you can check this out later. This is a lot all at once. Um, Some quick notes. We're going to talk about treatment next, my favorite part of this. Um, Age and gender do not have an effect on their potential for improvement. Now, that is not to say that those are not going to change therapy as a whole. Some two weeks ago, I had my 96-year-old lady who was struggling with her walker. Um, That's very different than the 23-year-old who had a concussion and is trying to get back to competitive volleyball. But they both have the potential to improve. The brain is plastic, um, so we're not going to be discounting someone because they're older. Um, In terms of central and vascular causes, we just mentioned concussion. Some of the central issues earlier in the slides, uh, if you are having issues in those areas, like the cerebellum, that is certainly, uh, balance is certainly something you want to consider. We're not going to go into super huge detail there, but the treatments I'm about to mention do benefit those. Um, I am not a provider who's able to prescribe medication. I'm a physical therapist, but that actually doesn't affect my patients too much. Long-term vestibular suppressants, so meclizine, for instance, are not conducive to long-term benefit. Um, You're going to be shutting down the vestibular system um, to a degree, and in order to overcome chronic dizziness, for instance, you need the inner ear to be able to give correct output to the brain. So we do not want to have long-term vestibular suppressant usage. Um, An exception would be something like Meniere's disease. You're going to go into phases of not-too-bad symptoms and severe days-on vertigo. During those days-on vertigo bouts, You're not doing vestibular rehab anyways. You need to suppress the symptoms, let them get back to a semblance of normalcy. And then during the non-vertiginous areas, um, that's when you want to start doing treatment, get rid of the, make sure they're not taking excessive vestibular suppressants. So the big one, everyone's favorite, BPPV. Um, As was mentioned, those crystals get stuck in the wrong tube. And again, if you want to treat BPPV, get yourself a little model. If you can't visualize this well, this is a must. Uh, Most commonly, the utricle is going to send that crystal into the posterior canal. This is a right ear, for instance. Um, The posterior canal, horizontal is next most common. Anterior is the most rare. I did just have someone yesterday with anterior, but it's not very common. The right side is 40% more likely to have BPPV than the left. Um, That's because across all cultures and people, people typically sleep on their right side. Um, There's some um, theorized reasons for that, but anyways. Um, it can also be on both sides. If you, I've seen a lot of PTs tripped up by this. If you have both sides um, experiencing BPPV, you want to fully clear a canal. Um, so if it's on the left side, for instance, fully clear that, get it gone, send them home. Then they're going to come back. You fully treat them for the right side. You don't want to mix and match in the same day. It's going to be excessively um, symptomatic, and it's going to start to blur really good positive findings. Um, The anterior and posterior canals on opposite sides are parallel, so anterior on this side and posterior here. So they're actually treated with the same techniques. You just need to flip the side. Horizontal gets its own because it's special. Um, If you're not sure of the BPPV, which side it's in, which canal it's in, maybe it's resolving and there are maybe a few weeks out from initial onset anyways, we actually have a solution for that as well that we'll see in a bit. With all of these, though, we need the crystal to get out of the tube. These are one-way paths. So if it's in the posterior canal, 
Everyone knows the Epley maneuver. I'm going to show it in a sec just in case you don't. But I'm going to be dropping them quickly onto their back so that that crystal falls to the bottom and I'm able to get it out of the tube. Um, if it's in the canal itself, the main tube, this is fairly straightforward. If it's in the cupola at the very end of any of the tubes, go figure, it's very sticky and adhesive. That crystal's going to be jammed in there. You need an even more vigorous approach. I'm not going to go in detail on all four of these, but these are the four techniques that I best recommend. The Epley is by far the one you're going to be using the most. Cement is if it is stuck in the uh, cupola, you need to get really vigorous. Appiani is in the horizontal canal. And the Zuma, which we'll get to in a second, um, that is a horizontal cupula lithiasis. The biggest mistake I see all providers making with this, you need to be vigorous with the movements. An Epley maneuver, the first stage of it is the Dix Hall Pike test. It should never take more than two seconds because you need to physically move those crystals. If you take your time with it, you may not get them all in one clump. Uh, I've done this, I've done all four of these techniques on patients into their 90s. I have never had a patient injured by it. Get some pillows ready, let them know exactly what's about to happen, prep them, and hang on to them well. Um, shouldn't be a problem. Every time you do change position with any of these, at least one minute needs to take place for settling the otoconia so that they're stuck or that they rest where they are and you can proceed. Lastly, um, for this slide, there is an older school thought that after a treatment like this, you need, I've heard, 24 to 72 hours where a patient stays upright. Um, there is no statistical evidence that says that that is actually needed and it's not going to prevent recurrence. In fact, it can prolong symptoms. We've mentioned 3PD earlier. Someone has a vestibular insult like this, and then they still have dizziness later, even after it's fixed. That's because they weren't receiving normalized inputs. Once I'm laying on my back again and it's normal, that's going to actually progress me faster to a normal positional tolerance. If I stay upright for three days, I've never done that in my life. I don't think it would be very comfortable for me, and the first time I lay back again, it's suddenly a lot of stimuli. The Epley Maneuver, just in case you're unfamiliar, if you only learned one of them today, this would be the one. The vast majority of cases are going to be in the posterior canal, and it's not going to be a cupula lithiasis. Again, this would be an example where it's either the right side posterior canal or the left side anterior canal. And as you can see there, I'm dropping the patient back, I'm rolling them over, and I'm getting the crystal to fall back into the utricle. Uh, this is, again, I would say master it with a model. Grab your friends. If this was in person, I'd have you all do it on the floor right now. It's a great technique to learn, um, but make sure you can really visualize what's happening if you want the best results. If you do have a horizontal cupulolithiasis, which is pretty uncommon, this is a technique. Uh, it, it is the least established what the best treatment is for it. This one um, it was recently proposed in 2017. Zuma is just the person who came up with the model, so that's what I'm referring to it as. They didn't actually name it. I have had a 100% success rate with this technique, so I really recommend it. You guys can check out that research a little later. Um, I'll have references at the end. So for a whole lot of other diagnoses, they're all going to have their own flavors to therapy and vestibular rehab. Um, acoustic neuroma may require surgery, for instance, but all of these, in terms of overcoming dizziness, uh, you're going to have the three basic uh, categories of treatment. A gaze stabilization exercise deals with that vestibulo-ocular reflex. Again, if I'm looking at the camera and my head's moving, my eye should have absolutely no problem keeping track of it perfectly. If that's off, we need to address it. Habituation drills have everything to do with positional tolerance. Every time I lean forward to get into the kitchen sink, every time I lay down quickly, I'm getting dizzy. We need to address that. And then like 90% of my job, functional training. This is balanced training specific to the patient to get them improved at those tasks. We're going to reduce the falls. We're going to reduce symptoms. So everyone at home can do this right now. You can stick a thumb up in the air, and you're going to shake your head no. If your eyes are not able to keep perfect track of that, either you're going too fast for your current level, or you really should hang out with me sometime. But the point is that I have a fixed target. It can be a sticky note on a wall. It can be your thumb. It can be a pen. But you're going to move your head back and forth. It can be up and down. You can even get into diagonals. The range is not important. Or actually, it's almost deleterious. If I go too far, I'm losing it out of my periphery. So it's a small range. 
and we find out the patient's threshold. You can even use a metronome. If this is how fast I can go to get dizzy, I'm going to go just shy of that, and we're going to slowly bolster that. An ice skater, for instance, can spin seven times in a second or more. I can't, uh, but they can handle that by doing spotting. They're doing a VOR movement um, just fine. If it's getting impractically fast or they have a really high need, again, an ice skater would need to be able to do this very fast, you actually add in movement of the target. So now it's moving contralaterally to my head at the exact same time. Same principles, though. I don't want a large range. I want to have a quick pace. And I find that threshold and build up from there. This affects way more than just vision, though. They have found amazing things in research saying that it helps with postural control. It helps with basically any category of dizziness. So this should be a go-to for almost every patient I see. Habituation, uh, this is all about increasing tolerance to position. This is an incredibly good example because it's also useful for BPPV, and it's really gentle for a patient that may not be as mobile. But I'm simply going to be sitting up, turn my head to one side, 45 degrees, so that I align canals, and I lay on my side. I spend 30 seconds there, 30 seconds upright, then I go the other way. You're repeating this for five minutes. The 30 seconds is the most important part. You can pick any position. Maybe, again, it's, I've had a few people lately, um, they hate bending forward to get into the underneath the sink. Then maybe I'm having them sitting and I'm tipping them forward for 30 seconds. We're convincing with central compensation, we're convincing the brain, it's okay to do this. It's okay to be in these positions. We normalize this, and you can build up speed from there. Then uh, the really fun part. There is an infinite number of exercises you could fit into this category, but functional balance training. A patient has vestibular hypofunction. Their inner ear is simply not giving enough information to the brain. Okay, so I'm going to take away your sense of touch by doing that on the foam pad. I have my feet together, so it's a balance challenge, and then I restrict your visual input. If I can't maintain this, then I may need to go a little easier, but now I have nothing to keep me upright, nothing to determine postural control except my inner ears. That's how we develop central compensation so that they can balance. I've done that exact picture on the right there with patients much older than you might expect, less uh, sturdy than you might expect, but it's a great place to begin. I'm going to keep it safe. I'm going to have a gate belt on them. I'll keep them in the corner. Um, I, especially if I give it for homework, they're going to be standing in a corner so that they might just bump their shoulder instead of a fall. But we need to get the brain to listen to the actual vestibular inputs or outputs. Um, the other category would be vestibular overload or vestibular challenges. Instead of restricting so I only have the inner ear, I give them their sense of touch, so flat ground. I give them their vision. But now I'm just rapidly increasing how much vestibular input they have to deal with. If they can't maintain balance while having all this input, that's going to be the issue. So we build up from there. Again, I could combine these. I could do this walking. I could have people walking backwards with their eyes closed, with head turns, whatever the patient may need. But this needs to be personalized training, and it's a vast part of my job and one of the reasons I really love it. All right, so that was for treating a whole lot of different things. Um, it, most cases of dizziness, this is where we're going to go. Some other conditions, though, so cervicogenic dizziness. I've personally known a few PTs and a couple PCPs that were struggling with cervicogenic dizziness. We already know that there's reflexes to and from the neck that deal with the vestibular system. If, especially if there's unilateral neck pain or neck dysfunction, they're getting a different timing for their afferents. That's going to cause me to feel really unbalanced. So first and foremost, just treat their neck. I've had patients in the past where all I did was start their neck treatments and the dizziness reduced. If it's been chronic especially, you may need to address other things, something like a VOR exercise. It's also working their neck a little bit, so you can certainly include that. But really, think about it as neck pain first, get into the dizziness later. The last few things. Um, so if someone does have something like a superior canal dehiscence and they do a surgery that fills it with bone cement, they no longer have a superior or anterior canal on that side, so the opposite side, posterior canal, has to handle that plane alone. Similarly, if someone has a vestibular nerve section or a labyrinthectomy, they are absent from vestibular inputs on that side, so the other side has to do all the work. A really fun way to do this is to stick an eye patch on the uninvolved side. Now that remaining side, they don't get any input for it visually, so vestibular sense has to be dominant. Um, and again, make it very personalized. 
Lastly, uh, Malde debarkment mentioned before. They go on a cruise. They come back. They're still at, in, on a cruise. They still feel like they're at sea. This can last for, I've had a patient with it, nine years later. This is not a super well-understood diagnosis. There's a lot of questions about it. It almost exclusively comes to patients with a pre-existing uh, anxiety or depressive disorder. For some reason, it's nine times more common in women. We don't have a lot of questions, or we have a lot of questions. We don't have a lot of answers. Um, this is extremely personalized. I literally make a list. Here are the specific positions and things that this patient can't tolerate, and that's pretty much all we hit. Um, so those are some less common treatments. But that's a basic overview of what a PT does for vestibular rehab training. Um, if anyone's ever has any questions, please get in touch. I'm at the Scottsdale ENT branch of Valley ENT. And I, uh, like I said, I'm a nerd, and I would love to answer any emails or anything about it or send patients my way if you really if feel they could benefit from it. A lot of these conditions, um, VRT is known to be more effective than medication, so I'd love to help out any patients I can. Um, thank you very much.